How many is happy you live in the United States of America? Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I don't think uh, any of us have, I know men that have served, I'm sure, and that are now serving, and I know we have young men even connected to our church that uh, are in the reserves and uh, possibility of being called, but you know those men know and uh, you know that have served, but all of us in our country, uh, I think, have a better appreciation of our country, don't we, folks, than we, than we have in a long, long time. And uh, thank God we live where we live. <laughs> I, uh, I wouldn't want to live anyplace else. I've been overseas several times in various countries, and every time I've come back, I wanted to get down and kiss the ground at New York City. I, I wanted to do it every time because I was so glad to be back in this country. And, and so we, we are privileged this morning, folks. We are privileged. Thank you for your allegiance to our country. Thank to our song leader, Brother Ron, who sang a very appropriate song this morning. The Lord inspired that. Thank the Lord for the powerful interpretations to the messages in tongues, which were right in alignment with the message today and with what God, I believe, is wanting to say to us in this service this morning. I would like you to do a favor for me. I know we're in a time of, of uh, people traveling and all again because of uh, leaves turning and, I guess, and everything. But uh, I would uh, like for you, if you see somebody that sits, sits next to you that's not here today, would you make an effort, you make an effort, to call them and tell them you missed them and hope to see them next Sunday. I know we have several families that are away traveling. We have some that are sick, and we need to pray for them. But folks, we need uh, to pray for our congregation. Are you with me? We need to pray for our church. We need to pray that God will make this church a powerful lighthouse to this community in this key age, time that we live in. We cannot allow this time to get past us without the church doing what she can do to minister to people that are, that are in our community that need God. So you pray with me, and I know God will help you to do that. Amen. If you have your Bibles this morning, I want you to turn with me to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 8. Is there anyone here for the first time this morning in our congregation? Anyone here for the very first time? There's a brother right back here, and uh, right on the back seat, and I know this brother. I just had the funeral for his wife of cancer. He drove 120 miles to be here today in church, and he tells me that he's going to make that 120-mile trip every Sunday to be with us. Let's give him a hand. Amen. Wonderful guy. He had a wonderful wife. I know all his family. In fact, uh, I used to pastor some of them. And we're happy to have you, my brother. And pray this service will be a great strength to you. And that Jesus Christ will be your strength and your Savior. Amen. Can you say amen? amen. Praise the Lord. 1 Timothy chapter 4. In verse 8. Hear the scripture before I read it. You can pull from it what you want. Whenever I don't want to lose weight, I use this scripture as a foundation. But that's not what it was intended for. This scripture is making, making two positive points. It's making a point that what we do in the flesh doesn't really count for much. I don't care if it's exercise, it's learning, I don't care if it's money, I don't care if it's status, these things are all important and we need to do them and have them, but here Paul is telling Timothy, he's saying, Timothy, don't forget what I'm telling you, you're going into the ministry as a young preacher and you don't know the ropes, you don't understand what you're asking for, you see, there's a problem today, and that's even in the ministry. 
There's a problem today that the ministry has become a job. It's become a vocation. The ministry is not a vocation. It is not a job. It is a calling. And money, even though we need it, is not the priority. Status is not the priority. Having X number of people in your church is not the priority. The priority is doing what you've been called to do. And doing it with all your heart. And with all your might. And with all your soul. And that's what this scripture deals with. For bodily exercise profiteth little. But godliness is profitable, what does it say? Unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. Heavenly Father, bless your word this morning. Make it real to every one of our hearts. Lord, let my heart uh, assimilate this message, Lord, and digest it, God, that it may become a fresh new part of me. I pray for us this morning that your word will find its lodging and that Holy Spirit our our ears will be tuned and our heart open to receive its truth. We thank you Holy Spirit for already being with us. Oh God and for allowing your presence to put your hand of pleasure upon all that has been done. Anoint me now Lord as your messenger I pray humbly. Cover me with your blood. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Billy Graham said a prayer. And I would like, somebody uh, gave this to me, and I'd like to uh, quote what Billy Graham prayed. It's called, Let Us Pray. Pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men. For not everyone has faith. But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect us from the evil one. May the Lord direct our hearts into God's love and Christ's perseverance. No man can bring peace to a troubled world because it is not his to give. Did you hear that? And one of the greatest preachers in my, as far as I'm concerned, one of the greatest preachers that have ever lived is Billy Graham. That's one of the greatest ministers of the gospel that has ever lived on this globe. He says, No man can bring peace to a troubled world because it is not his to give. Christ said, My peace I give unto you. It is not the peace of man, but the peace of God. We cannot give what does not belong to us. Ask for God's peace and see what a transformation will take place in all of our lives. Can you say amen? Amen. Billy Graham. This morning, if I was to use a theme, I'd like to use these, these words. Religion pays. There was a day I was telling my secretary, uh, uh, Joyce, one day in the office when I was, I brought the message down to to copy it so they could uh, get it on the computer. I said there was a day in my ignorance when I was a little more ignorant than I may be now. When I used to say that religion was sinful. Religion was not of God. The only thing that I thought was true was Christianity. But in my dopiness, you ever call anybody a dope? Anybody? Don't raise your hand. Okay? I didn't realize that the word religion actually means godliness in practice. That's what it means. And until I began to learn the meaning of the word, I didn't understand that everybody needs religion. Everybody does. None of us can live without it and should not. This message today is a practical message. It's a message I trust will help me and help all of you to be able to put into practice what religion really means. Someone has said a scene 
religion is not always real, but a real religion is always seen. And my message will, will uh, emphasize this as we go about. This morning, ladies and gentlemen, godliness means belief in God and a daily practice of that belief. How does religion pay? How do we obtain godliness? How do we get religion? That used to be an old-fashioned term. Have you ever heard anybody back in the old days say, well, that lady got religion. <laughs> and uh, she, you know, she went home shouting, you know, and, and somebody at home said, boy, you must have got religion. Well, that's great, you know, that's an experience, but religion is practicality. It's putting into use the godliness that God has imputed into your and my life. How do we obtain this religion, this godliness? Number one, you may want to write these down. For religion to pay in your and my life, you have to know, first of all, and be convinced that God is. Now, you know, you may sit there and say, man, oh man, that's nothing new to me. But if I can talk plainly this morning, and I'm going to, sometimes people don't act like it. Christian people don't act like they know that God really is. They don't live like it. They're not interested like it. They don't pay the price like it. They don't sacrifice like it. They don't understand God like He really is. David's assurance, ladies and gentlemen, was, I shall not want, Psalm 23 and verse 1. David's assurance was, I shall not want. This was predicated on his knowledge that the Lord is my shepherd. Without him being my shepherd, then I have no assurance that God is. David, as his little baby had died, I use this so much, this scripture, it's known around the world. I remember the other day I had a funeral, and when I got ready to read this portion of scripture, I asked those in attendance, which was over 200 people at that funeral, I asked them if they would would be able to quote it with me. If so, please to do it. And I tell you, when I started uh, quoting Psalm 23, everybody in the place quoted it with me. Everybody. Ladies and gentlemen, it's one of the most well-known scriptures in the Bible. David wrote it because he needed to hear from the God of gods. He needed help as his little baby. And I know a lot of that was because of what he had done. God brought judgment on him. And his baby died. And he stood there and he said, God, I need to hear from you. I need to hear from heaven. And God said, write these words and live by them. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And David began to write those powerful scriptures uh, from his heart as the Holy Spirit gave them to him. You see, God doesn't ask for faith without evidence. Never. Never does he ask for faith without evidence. That doesn't mean you can explain everything. But God always furnishes a reason for always. It reminds me of something I read recently. The writer said, I believe it is time to call attention to the simple wisdom of that modern proverb. When all else fails, follow directions. Take the Bible, for instance, this morning. God asked us to believe that it is like no other book that it is infallible. This morning, I'm going to ask the question, and if you don't understand the word infallible, 
then I'm going to explain it to you first. The Bible, when it, we say it's infallible, we say there's not one mistake in it. It cannot fail. How many in this church this morning, by the upraised hand, believes that the Bible is infallible? Praise the Lord. Then that book has to become the premise of our salvation. Can you say amen? We take the Bible. We believe there's no other book like it. So we comb the pages as Christians. We test each verse. I do it, and you do it, that are ministers. Every week, we do this to make a sermon. We, we comb the verses. We pick out every word. We analyze it. We try to come up with the fullness of its truth. For that's where our strength comes from. But I believe lay people must do the same. I don't think you can live from Sunday to Sunday on the pastor's message. You just can't do that. You need to go to the Word of God yourself and say, this book is more than a book. It's what I stand on. It's my very life flow. It's everything I am and ever will be. And I'm not going another day, whether it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, or whatever, until I have taken some of it and analyzed it and eaten it and put it away and digested it. So we comb the pages and we test each verse. And you find, ladies and gentlemen, don't you, that the evidence is there. Without this evidence, I speak for myself. Religion, Christianity could not sustain itself. I would buckle under temptation. I say this to you as your pastor, and I say this humbly as an individual, not a, some, some highfalutin saint. Uh, I'm not above temptation. I'm not above making mistakes. And I'll tell you something, folks. I would buckle under temptation I could not live a godly life, sir. I couldn't, as your pastor, if I had to pretend there was a God. If I had to pretend that this Bible is nothing more than a novel, I could not stay above temptation. But I'll tell you, I know there's strength in life in that book. And when I read it, it brings new standards to my life. High standards me to live by. How many can say amen? amen? Oh, thank God. Page two. Superstition can never support godliness. Well, it's a good omen. It's luck. There's no such thing as luck. that sink in a minute. I've heard so much of that on the news. I was lucky. I watched the documentary on the fireman and that little, that little African American lady. How many saw that documentary of those uh, firemen that one group of firemen kept alive under a stairwell? How? I don't know. But it's estimated that the floor they were on fell seven stories. And not one of them had a scratch. And this little lady they were bringing down the steps, she was a little African-American lady. She, uh, she got to the point of that place. And she said, I'm not going any further. I am so tired. She had come like 30 stories. She was so tired, an elderly lady. I'm not going any further. You guys go on, but I am not making another step. I can't. And the dust, they said, was 11 to 12 inches thick on them. They couldn't breathe. They had their hands in their mouths, dragging it out of their mouths so they could breathe. And the firemen all said, we'll not leave you. We'll not leave you. And because they stayed with 
lives were saved. If they'd have kept going, all of them would have lost their life. Jesus said these words. I find it in this book. It brings tears to my eyes. I find it in this book that is more than a novel. It's the infallible word of God. Behold, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Psalm 91, I will have an angel available. Lest you stump your foot against a stone, they will lift you up and protect you. That's not luck. It's God. How many can say amen? Hallelujah. That's God. Nothing more, nothing less. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, when I talk about religion pays, I must have an unshakable foundation. I need more than family tradition. Well, my family went to this church, their family went to this church, their family went to this church, and I'm going to this church or I'm going to do this, or I'm going to do that. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't serve God because of family tradition. When we stand before God, you'll stand alone. How many believes that? Your wife won't be with you, sir. Lady, your husband won't be beside you. You won't be holding your kids' hands. Your children will have to stand before God alone. Every one of these teenagers will have to be alone. They stand before Almighty God at the judgment. Nobody will be with them. The Bible says his eyes will be like eyes of fire. His mouth, as it were, a sword. Flame of fire. His voice has many waters. As he questions us on our faithfulness to that book. You say, why is that true, Pastor? Because the end of the book says, it's finished. If you add anything to it, or take anything away from it, thou shalt be accursed. So that is the book of books. The word of words. Nothing else counts but that book. How many would stand to your feet and say, I agree? That's what's going to take it through. Thank you very much. You may be seated. That's what's going to take us through. That's what's going to make our faith worth something. In the end. You see, I need fact this morning. I don't need fables or legend or mystics. Somebody has said if we have an attack of real religion, it will be contagious. I would to God that my religion in this town would be contagious. That everywhere I go, people would say, I want what that preacher has. I don't know what it is, but I want it. And I want more of it. You see this in Psalm 119. Psalm 119 in verse 99. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I don't know whether you got that or not. It doesn't putting down teachers or anybody else. What it's saying is there is a certain, certain reality to this book that comes to us when God begins to reveal himself to us. And uh, I'll tell you, if you ask God for a revelation, He'll give you one. And I ask Him every day, I ask Him every Sunday, God, reveal this book to me. I cannot get up and preach the same message Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. I've got to stand here and I've got to preach a new revelation. Something that will touch the hearts of man. How about John 17 and verse 3? And this is life eternal, 
that we might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Listen to me this morning, ladies and gentlemen. You just have to know that God is. You got to be convinced. What if you're sick? What if you got disease in your body? If you don't know that God is, you don't have anybody to go to. But if you know that God sent His Son, Jesus Christ, uh, to die on a cross uh, and receive stripes on His back and His body mutilated so that you might be healed. If you know that and you're convinced about that, you can get out of your pew this morning and come to this altar and be anointed with oil and believe that that Jesus can heal you. It's the same with salvation. I can't believe that He is. There's no chance I can avoid hell. There's absolutely no chance. For the Bible says, they that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ shall be saved. I've got to believe that He is Job even knew it when he wrote in Job 19 and verse 25. Hey, I like this. This was written back in the beginnings. This is one of the earliest books written. And Job said these words, For I know that my Redeemer liveth. <laughs> That had to be a revelation. How many can say amen? That had to be. That was thousands of years before Jesus was ever introduced here on earth. Born of a virgin. He said, I know. He didn't say, oh, I wish. I hope. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. And that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. How many believe he's coming back? Praise the Lord. The first time he comes back, the beginning of the day of the Lord, he'll not touch the earth. He'll come in the clouds. But the second time he comes back, the Bible says he'll put his foot on the Mount of Olives and that baby will split all the way down the middle, right down into the Valley of Angelon. There is where the Battle of Armageddon will take place. Jesus will march his armies into the city of Jerusalem and he'll take his throne and the Bible says he will rule with a rod of iron. He'll rule the whole world, the whole world with a rod of iron for 1,000 years. Oh, praise God. You say, where will we be, Pastor? I'm going to be with him. I don't know where you'll be. I'm going to be with him. Praise the Lord. I'm going to rule. You say, what kind of body you got? I'm not having this old freckled body. I can tell you that right now. I'm going to have a new body. A handsome body. Healthy body. I'm going to have an eternal body that will never be destroyed. And I'll come and I'll walk the streets of Jerusalem and I will rule and reign with him a thousand years. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I always like to put it this way. Wherever he goes, I go. Never to leave his side. Ever, ever. Again. Oh, man, let me tell you. How does religion pay? It pays when we are absolutely sure that God is. Number two, for religion to pay, there must be sincerity. Someone has written, we, we have just, uh, it says we, it just means a general phrase there. We have just enough right, but not enough to make us love. How true that is. The more of God we get, the less we criticize. Are you with me? The less we criticize, the more of God we get, the happier we get. There is no godliness. Put it in your notes. There is no godliness without sincerity. Yet it is the best counterfeited item on earth. That is why there are so many. And this is a quote from C.M. Ward. He's uh, the second greatest preacher I've ever known on the globe. This is a quote from him. That is why there are so many hypocrites in the church today. <laughs> I know the world says that. I'd go to church, but there's too many hypocrites. But believe it or not, folks, now I'm just saying this generally. Don't start throwing tomatoes at me. But uh, 
there are hypocrites within the church also, much as we hate to admit it. Let's just hope that none of us are one. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's better to be there than out, right? That's right. Amen. Maybe God will change them. Isn't that right, my brother? Praise the Lord. Good. Thanks a lot, brother. Doug, thank you. He's listening, this boy is. Listen to me. A hypocrite can talk like a saint. This is C.M. Ward. A hypocrite can be as precise as a saint. A hypocrite can dress like a saint. A hypocrite can be outwardly pious and yet all the time in the heart, this is his words, be a devil. Isn't that the truth? The Pharisees were pious. These people were pious professionally. Their total design was to gain influence, to impress those who judged by outward appearance. Jesus gave all of himself to and for us and for our sins. Can we dare do less today? You say, what does that mean? It means let's be sincere. Let's mean what we're doing and do it like we mean it. You see, there, sir, is true grip in my estimation. Authority and godly sincerity. I know the God that I serve. I'm sincere about my walk with him. I'm going to walk like I mean it. Number three, for religion to pay, there must also be zeal. This is something we struggle with. Boy, the Holy Spirit spoke so many key words this morning in both of the messages that were interpreted right out of my sermon, right smack out of my sermon, word for word. The Bible says that David danced before the Lord. He was a successful politician. He was a popular general. He married into society, but the Bible says he still danced. Now, there's a difference between dancing for the devil and dancing for the Lord. I'm not going to get into a whole new thing here. But I want you to know that that's why I don't go to the dance floor. And I don't dance in the world because I quit dancing for the devil. Can you say amen? I dance only if I do it, which it takes a fireball from heaven to ever make me do that. Because first of all, I don't know how to do it. And secondly, it has to be the Holy Ghost if I'm going to do it. But if I'm going to dance, I'm going to dance for him. Can you say amen? David danced before the Lord. Paul knew every affliction in the book. But, sir, nothing could keep him from glory. He made headlines wherever he went. Solomon knew wealth and prestige, as few will ever be privileged to know on earth. And he said in the Song of Solomon, chapter 8 and verse 7, Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the floods drown it. If a man would give all the substance of his house for love, it would be utterly condemned. Did you hear that this morning? Ladies and gentlemen, religion is meant to be like that. When it becomes irksome, when your godliness and religion becomes irksome, cold, boring, then it is no longer religion and it is no longer godliness. It reminds me, C.M. Ward, I quote, Do you apply the same standards of faithfulness to your Christian activities that you expect from other areas of your life? If, you start, if your car starts once every three tries, if your paper boy skips delivery Monday and Thursday, is he trustworthy? If you don't go to work once or twice a month, are you a loyal employee? 
If your refrigerator stops working for a day or two now and then, do you say, oh, well, it works most of the time? If your water heater provides an icy cold shower every now and then, is it dependable? If you miss a couple of loan payments every year, does the bank, does the bank say 10 out of 12 isn't bad? <laughs> if you fail to worship God when the services are available, or just show up one or two Sundays a month, which you expect to be called a Christian. We expect faithfulness and reliability from things and other people. Does not God expect the same from us, he goes on. The problem is that in our religious activities, we see ourselves as volunteers rather than duty. Listen to me closely. For a volunteer, almost anything seems acceptable. Do it or we don't have to. At least we think that way. For a bond servant who is duty bound, faithfulness is always expected. You say, where's that in the Bible? Matthew chapter 25 won't be on your screen. Matthew 25 and verse 21 it says, if you're faithful in a few things, little things, I'll make you ruler over many things. And I, I'm going to say this. I didn't, I'm taking this from our board meeting. Last Tuesday night, we got to talking about faithfulness. So I made the statement to our, our boards, trustee and deacon boards. I said, guys, let's us set the standard. Let's we men set the standard. Let us prove faithful. Then the congregation will follow us. Are you with me? Good. Are you with me? Am I with you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am, believe it or not. You see, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to please note today, godliness is profitable unto all things. In fact, in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 26, it says, For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? We go one step further in our main text, 1 Timothy 4 and verse 8, the last part of the verse. Godliness is also profitable unto all times. And it says, In that which is to come. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory down the road. While we look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. In closing this morning, I would like to list, to you, list for you, and I'm just going to go down these very quickly, just four influences, four ways that religion influences you and me. Number one, I believe that godliness or religion influences health. If I'm right with God, I'm going to feel better. How many's ever been under conviction? <laughs> it ain't a good feeling, is it? Hmm? Makes a, a knot in your gut, doesn't it? When you know the Holy Spirit is talking to you and there's something not right in your life and you just feel that bad feeling down in there. It's like, it's like uh, uh, what was it that happened to me? Uh, so many things this week. I can't remember. Have you ever got that bad? But something happened and I said, why me? You know, you ever say that? Why me? Oh, the battery quit. Yeah. Why me? But anyway, uh, we got a new battery and we're on our road. I believe that the more godliness we have in our life, the healthier we are. 
You say, is there any scripture? That's right, Brother Craver. Is there any scripture to fortify that? Yes, there is. Yes, there is. You turn with me this morning, if you would, first of all, to Proverbs 10, 27. Here's what it says. The fear of the Lord prolongeth days, but the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Go back with me, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 27. Here it is again. The fear of the Lord is a fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. There's something about a good feeling in your life from knowing that we're living right and doing right. It brings a certain peace to us. A certain peace. It's not easy to lose your appetite, sir, lady, young person, when you know that you're in default. You lose your appetite, your nerves start springing up, you can't sleep at night, you're worried about what tomorrow holds, you're worried every time somebody looks at you that uh, uh, they are accusing you. We don't have to do that when we're living lives of godliness. We don't have to. To do that. Number two, not only does godliness influence health, but godliness influences our reputation. I have just one thing I'd like to say. I've talked to, and I made it a point this week to do it. I went to several businesses around Morgantown while I was at hospitals and stuff because I wanted to know what their idea was. And I said, what kind of people would you rather hire? I didn't even finish it. Every single one of them told me I'd like to hire somebody that has some affiliation with a church. What does that tell you? What does that tell you? I'll tell you something, folks. Godliness helps your reputation. Now, there's still people going to talk about you. There's still people going to conjure up stuff about you. But you don't have to worry about it if you know there's nothing to it. I don't let stuff like that bother me because I'm walking the best I can with the Lord. And and the world will do those things. But yet, your reputation speaks for itself. And people will respect you when you're godly. I'm telling you, they will respect you when you're godly. When you live, how many believe this? When you live what you say, people will respect it. Every single time. Every single time. Number three. Not only does godliness influence health and reputation, but godliness influences happiness. You don't need the bottle anymore. How many can say amen to that? Don't need the bottle anymore. Don't need the weed anymore. You don't need the drugs anymore. You don't need the world anymore. When you get godliness, it brings happiness. Happiness. Praise the Lord. How many could attest to that this morning? How many's happy in Jesus? Praise the Lord. Amen. Last but not least, godliness influences contentment. Contentment. I'm sort of a I mean, I, I'm a hyper individual, you know, and I, I, I have nerves. How many believe I have nerves? Talk to Joyce, Ruth Ann, anybody who works in the office, any of the staff, they know I got nerves. And I get that from my mother. I got to blame somebody. But I'll tell you something, folks. It doesn't take much to con- make me content. It really doesn't. It really doesn't take much. You just just give me a little something to eat every day and a chair to sit in before I go to bed and some place where I can walk in the woods now and then and a church like this where I can kneel at this old altar. called contentment. Contentment. 
Here's what Paul said in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Always tell Rose, she gets real scared. When we retire, Rose, we don't need anything else, maybe a 10 by 10 room. We don't need a car. We can walk wherever we go. <laughs> I just get her going. You know? <laughs> and I think I'm just going to build this 10 by 10 out in the middle of the woods where nobody knows where I'm at. No, you're not! <laughs> Verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. I've been when there was no money, when there was no house, when there was no ship, and I was in the water. And I know what it is to have all things. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. That, ladies and gentlemen, is called contentment. Verse 13 is not on your screen, but I'd like to read it. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Ladies and gentlemen, this morning, we're going to pray for needs in a broad spectrum today. But listen to me. Godliness is profitable. What are we sowing today? Soon, Ladies and gentlemen, we will have to reap. Sir, lady, this morning, are you struggling to make a godly decision about your lifestyle? Are you struggling to make decisions on your testimony? On your family confrontations? On your stand on holiness? On your convictions about sin? On your church faithfulness? Do you struggle with these things? I heard the Holy Spirit say it in the second message it was given. I heard the Holy Spirit say it in the first phrase. You're struggling. How many remember that? You're struggling. And God help us if we're struggling with these things to turn it over to God. And make it in our heart that we're going to, we're going to practice religion. Which is godliness. We're going to make what this message says our lives a practical thing. And we're going to live out our life for Jesus until he comes. Would you stand with me, please? I'm not going to ask for any raised hands this morning, but I know there's some folks that already are going to be coming. If there are some things that you need to lay on the altar this morning and ask God to give you some real heartfelt direction in any of these things. I want you to step out of your seat and just walk up to the front of this building and we're going to commit those things to God. We're going to give them to Him. If you never met the Lord as your personal Savior, don't you walk. You say, what does that mean, Pastor? It means to ask Him to forgive you of your sins and to save you so you're ready for heaven. If you're not sure about that, you walk up this aisle also. You stand at this old-fashioned altar. Make the commitment today. Don't hold back. Would you come? We're going to close this service this way. Thank you. Folks are already coming. Folks are already coming. everyone an opportunity you want to lay something on the altar you want to practice your religion you want to do it with all your heart now's the chance to make that pact with God I'm going to do it I'm going to do it with all my heart and all my life I'm not going to let go anything I'm going to keep what he's given me going to linger, but I just feel like it takes time sometimes for the Holy Spirit to talk to us the way He wants to. If you feel
feel anything in your heart tugging you, that's time for you, as well as me, to make our way to this place of commitment. There'll be someone at the door if you need to go to greet you. We ahead of time want to thank every one of you for being here. Come again and worship with us. May God richly bless you. But if you can and you have time, find a place to pray. This is God's.